introduce myself. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Weingarten. I'm a senior fellow at the think tank New America. Um, I focus my research on uh, gender insecurity. Um, broadly speaking, um, have more recently um, been focused on um, cybersecurity and nuclear security, but have kind of um, spanned a lot of different topics um, in, in my work. Um, I'm also the founder um, and director of the Global Gender Parity Initiative at New America, which elevates um, research and journalism on, um, uh, on global gender issues. Um, so it's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much um, to Dr. Hudson and to the Bush School um, for the opportunity to moderate um, this fantastic panel. So really, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, when I talked to Dr. Hudson a, a few weeks ago about her vision for this particular panel, um, what she said was she was interested in learning how the sausage gets made. Um, and specifically, um, we hear a lot about women, peace, and security. We hear a lot about women, peace, and security policy. Um, but, but what does the actual implementation look like? What does it kind of um, look like day to day? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take you behind the scenes here into some of the processes um, and, uh, you know, what's actually happening kind of on the ground and in institutions. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to introduce my um, fantastic panelists here. So I'll start over at, uh, in the end um, with Brad Orchard. Um, he works in the peace and security section of UN Women as a policy specialist and military liaison officer on preventing sexual exploitation and abuse gender-enabled peacekeeping and security sector reform. Uh, Brad is an officer in the Australian Army, seconded to UN Women. He has experience in cultural reform and gender diversity. Um, he's been responsible for the implementation of the Australian National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security in the Australian Department of Defense, and he's worked with the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, I will now go to Commander um, Suzanne Almainer. She has served as a political political military advisor and action officer in the direct deputy directorate for global policy and partnerships, um, joint staff strategic plans and policy directorate. She manages the women, peace and security portfolio along with various other portfolios for joint staff. Um, Maynard commanded the USS Patriot where she took the ship through an extended and arduous maintenance period, eventually leading her on a highly successful Japanese friendship patrol, strengthening bilateral relations. Um, I, maybe if we have time, we'll hear a little bit more about that, because I think that sounds like a great story. Um, during her time on board, um, USS Patriot earned her fourth, fifth, and sixth consecutive Battle E awards, and her personal decorations include the Meritus Service Medal, um, Navy and Marine Corps Co Commendation Medal, Navy and Marine Corps uh, Achievement Medal, and various other service and campaign awards. Um, finally, we have um, Olivia Holt Avery. She is an independent consultant on gender, peace, and security. She advises multilateral government and nonprofit clients on strategy, policy, and programs related to diversity and inclusion in peace and security and the integration of civil society partners. Her topical expertise includes gender in security sectors, national action plans on women, peace, and security, women's inclusion in ceasefires and constitution-making processes, and her clients include Save the Children U.S., the U.S. Department of Defense, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the U.N. Development Program. So if you had any questions about the qualifications of the panelists, I hope that I put all those to rest. Um, and as, as far as I'm you know, considered, um, as a journalist, um, much of what Jamie um, just said really um, spoke to me. I'm always seeking out kind of the human stories and all this. So in that vein, um, you know, what I wanted to start with was, of course, a few stories. Um, really, implementation, as we all know, begins and ends with people, um, each of you. And as most of us can attest, the implementation of this particular policy framework, this particular set of ideas um, and agenda is really not easy. Um, and that means that a lot of times the people who get involved in this work also happen to be intrinsically as well as extrinsically motivated. So I think first I really wanna know, um, how did each of you get here today? What's your story of really discovering the importance of women, peace and security? So Livy, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Um, thank you, first of all, to Valerie Hudson, who is like our god. If you can't hear the guru <laughs> kind of group back here that's cheering for her. That's true. Um, <laughs> and to the Bush School for having us, of course. 
and to Elizabeth and to all of the fellow panelists who are joining us today. Um, so my personal story, um, I don't think is particularly remarkable, but I will share it nonetheless. So I um, used to work in think tanks primarily, national security think tanks and foreign policy think tanks focused largely on Middle East policy or US foreign policy in the Middle East um, and particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and we were discussing over dinner last night this new um, ranking that uh, WISE, Women in International Security, just put out on think tanks and gender representation in think tanks, not only within the senior fellows, but also with, within their board and their leadership. And, you know, you can take one look at that and see that it's pretty dismal. And that was very much my experience. So I became tired of being one of a sprinkling of women in any room. Um, I became tired of these policy shaping conversations that were largely um, absent of any representation from the regions that we were, you know, purporting to be experts on. Um, and so I came, I came, became disillusioned with the with the scene in general and kind of with the foreign policy establishment. Not to make it sound too drastic. <laughs> um, and I think I, you know, unknowingly stumbled upon the vision that I was looking for when I came across women, peace, and security. Um, and I'm sure you know we'll talk a little bit more about why that is and what that looks like to me. Um, but that's that's how I came to this. Commander Manner. Yeah. So my my story kind of well, first of all, thank you for uh, <laughs> for having uh, me. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. Um, uh, it's every time we get together, it's something like this. It sort of re-energizes and re-motivates. So I think there's definitely value in it. Um, so my story for how I came to WPS is a little bit more military. <laughs> um, uh, so I was funneled into this um, as part of the routine detail detailing process. So I've uh, been in the Navy for 17 years. Um, most of that's been operational in the Pacific Ocean, on ships, on the waterfront, with sailors, you know, shooting guns and that type of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, with I, so I went to NPS in Monterey, and then I spent some time in San Diego. Um, but I was fortunate to do um, a legislative fellowship for one of my shore tours in D.C., um, where I was uh, exposed to, so I worked for a congressman on the Hill for one year, and because of the, the events that fellows are allowed to go to, I, I, I went to some WPS events. And so that's where I first learned about it. Um, it was on, that was in 2013, so it was only a few years ago. Um, and so then when my husband and I were moving back to the D.C. area, I was looking for jobs and talked to my detailer, and I found out that this job on the joint staff dealt with WPS, and I knew what it was about, and so I jumped at the opportunity to contribute to the ongoing work. So that is how I came to land on the joint staff holding the Women, Peace, and Security portfolio for the chairman. Great. Brad? Uh, I'll, I'll share, um, share my panelists' thanks to, to Valerie and everyone else for having us here. I, I, I won't use the term God, I'll say rock star. <laughs> I think that's a bigger thing uh, uh, for, for many of us. And, and it was an absolute pleasure to have, have Valerie in Australia uh, a couple of years ago. And she spoke to our first ever Women, Peace and Security course. Uh, as, and, and set the scene, and that you know the motivation that provided to the students was was incredible. Uh, so we thank you again for that. Uh, I, I came to this. I'm a, a conventional infantry officer by background. I've been in the army for a, for a very long time, and it's only been the last sort of seven years now that I've been working in gender diversity, culture reform, and and now women, <coughs> peace, and security. Uh, and and it was sort of a succession of hosting decisions that that. that I don't think was ever my plan. I don't say that in a bad way, but it was kind of never where I thought I would end up, nor was it, I think, sort of a deliberate plan to prepare me to be here today. It, it's just you know, a, a happy coincidence, happenstance, that that, that, that was the case. Uh, and so each of those decisions was sort of logical in its own, its own right, but, but, but just was taken as, a, as an independent decision. Uh, having said that, you know, I, 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 I've loved all of those jobs uh, I, I think they're incredibly important. You know, my intrinsic motivation in this uh, is, is about organisational and operational capability. It's, we need to be the best organisation. We all need to have the best organisations that we possibly can. And, and if you can't access half of the talent, then you're not going to be. That's just a simple matter of fact. And, and the complexity is, is making the organisation able to access half of the talent, making it attractive to the people uh, and, and enabling the people, when, when you do get them, to, to allow them to contribute in, in the way that they are able to, in the way that they want to. 
So I, I kind of look at this from, and we, we discussed this in, in, in UN Women earlier in the year, where everyone had to sort of say, well, why did you come to this whole gender equality piece? And, and from me, my perspective, it's, it's about waste. Uh, if, if we don't build a society that can take advantage of everyone's skills and abilities and, and their contributions, then we're not nearly going to be the society that we could be. And, and you know, if you think about how many Confucius's or how many Sun Tzu's or how many Einstein's or Hawking's we haven't, you know, we've missed out on through the ages because only half and a lot of the time even less than half of the population was allowed to contribute and women were almost always amongst that group that was excluded. Well, you, you realise what a waste it's been and, you know, what anything we can do to fix that, I think, is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, before we get into the kind of nitty gritty of how WPS works for each of you um, every day. Um, again, kind of with the story <coughs> theme, um, I'm wondering if, I know some of you might have stories to share about kind of a, a moment um, when you were able to see um, whether it was a particular challenge of implementing WPS really acutely, maybe it was kind of a particular success um, something worked really well, something didn't work well, but um, anything that you can speak to to kind of um, paint a, a picture of kind of a scene um, and a moment that might help um, illustrate kind of what it is that, that you're trying to do. Um, so I don't know if you want, you want to sure. take a stab. Sure. Um, so first of all, I, I want to say that it's incredibly difficult to find stories of what successful WPS implementation looks like in policies precisely because most national action plans, which are the national level strategies that um, roughly 76 countries around the world are currently using to implement this, and many other WPS policies, standalone policies, do not have rigorous monitoring and evaluation plans. So we are not monitoring the implementation, we are not collecting data on what's going well and what's not, and that's really shooting ourselves in the foot here because then it's very difficult to make a case next time around that we need another nap or we need to keep doing this because we can't show how we've moved the needle. So I think too often you know, we are reduced to sharing the one or two anecdotes that we've seen in our lives precisely because we can't say, oh, well, check out, you know, go to www.state.gov and check out all the great data and, and you know, metrics there. We don't have that. Um, so I will share an anecdote. <laughs> um, and this, is, this comes from uh, a long-running Sudan and South Sudan program that uh, we used to run at my former organization, the Institute for Inclusive Security. Um, so we were active for over a decade in supporting this incredible task force of women um, in Sudan and in South Sudan who were advocating, amongst other things, for greater inclusion in the peace process, um, both international and then later in South Sudan during the Civil War. And one of, the, one of their many contributions to the peace process was at one point they were doing a series of consultations with local communities um, on issues in the peace process, right? And at the time, the SPLA, which is the, the rebel group in South Sudan, was conditioning resumption of the peace talks on greater humanitarian access. <clears throat> now, what was interesting was the, these women were out doing these consultations with communities, and what they heard was not, we need greater humanitarian access or greater humanitarian aid. What they heard was, we need the rebels and the government to stop shooting so we can go out and till our own fields and produce our own food. And those are two very different perspectives on the same problem and will lead you to two very different solutions, right? One is gonna be much more focused on opening these humanitarian corridors and the other one is gonna say, no, that's kind of the red herring. What we really need here is to get you guys to stop shooting so you, these folks can produce their own food. So that's kind of a, an anecdote of what WPS could look like if it was successfully implemented in policy. Um, but too often, these types of examples, I mean, these were women who took the, their own initiative to do these consultations, right? They were funding it themselves, they were looking, or with the help of partners like Inclusive Security, they were then knocking on doors of policymakers and compelling them to listen. It was all external driven. What we don't have enough of are policies that drive this. We don't have enough peace processes that are designed with women's organizations from the very get-go to design these participatory processes. We don't have international mediators or policymakers demanding these types of gender-sensitive participatory mechanisms. We don't have sufficient international funding to fund these women's groups to go out and do these consultations. 
and we don't have sufficient feedback mechanisms built into these processes so that when we do have these great insights from communities, they are brought back into the policy process at a point in which they can impact <coughs> what's happening. And so, of course, you know, this is how it would ideally be implemented, but unfortunately, we're not there yet from having that demand on the policy side. Brad, I think you also had a, a story to share. I, I oh, do, you, I have, do too, you do so. too. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so it's a small one because a lot of the stories that I have from the policy level in the Pentagon, I probably shouldn't share. <laughs> um, but but uh, I have found myself traveling quite a bit in the last year and a half that I've been doing this job, minus some baby leave. Um, which is relevant because uh, for most of the time that I've been, been in this job, when I do, when I am on travel, it's just hard to talk. I know. Um, <laughs> I've had to, you know, pump so that I can keep keep the breast milk going. Um, and I cannot tell you how many times I've pumped in like handicapped bathrooms and you know just all kinds of hurdles uh, so that I can keep my mother my mother gender duties up as well as participate and contribute to this, um, you know, the WPS efforts. Um, in my job in the military. And so um, just one, uh, so you hear, I, he I've, I heard a lot of stuff uh, working in this field in the Pentagon. And one of the things that, that struck me, one of the little quips that I've heard that, uh, that has stuck with me is, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, mm -hmm. right? And so I thought that was brilliant and so true and so like applicable across so many different, so many different things. And uh, so, so my one little story that I will share with you all about this is, uh, so I was traveling to Sweden for the WPS CHOD conference, so Chief of Defense conference that was hosted uh, by the uh, Supreme Commander, of the Swedish Armed Forces, um, one to three October, so not that long ago, right? Um, it was a phenomenal event, lots of good conversation. Um, but I was traveling with all of my equipment for my motherly duties, and um, so on the way back, I had these little bags of, you know, liquid that I'm trying to get on the airplane, right? And uh, the policy and these, these two young men that came, you know, I, I, I had done everything I was supposed to do with the airlines. I called ahead. I made sure that, you know, I was checking all the boxes for carrying this stuff back. I got pre-approval for the dry ice and everything. Um, but the two men, the two young men that happened to be manning the security uh, section of the airport in Sweden as I was flying back um, weren't familiar with the policies. Uh, they wouldn't give me their supervisor who was unavailable, right? Um, and the policy that they were familiar with and that was written into their books was that you couldn't, you had to have the baby with you if you had milk. And I was, yeah, exactly. And I was like, <laughs> I can, purpose, you know, right? so, so this is me coming back from the WPS conference. So I was like, I can promise you in Sweden, you know, I was flying through Finland on my way back and I was like, I can promise you boys that when these policies were made, there was no women at the table making these policies. These <laughs> yeah. poor boys were just like, I mean, they were like 23 or 24. So I, you know, I did what I had to do. And, uh, you know, so that's just, you know, participation, right? Meaningful participation <laughs> yeah. of women at policymaking uh, points, right? Impacting, like slowing yep. down, impacting real, like working mothers, trying, trying to like contribute and like get back home to my babies. Um, yeah. So that's my, my policy participation <laughs> story. That's great. Anecdote. That is a great um, story. And just a small tip of the iceberg of what I've had to deal with. Um, the other yeah. thing I appreciate about that story is that it's like one of the few stories I've ever heard that doesn't paint the Scandinavian countries in some kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know, like yeah. perfect light. Um, so yeah. that's, that's also refreshing that yeah. they're not always perfect. Yeah, <laughs> we're all works in progress, yes. right? So, so the only other thing I would add was um, at this WPS Child Conference, which was amazing, there was lots of good conversation and uh, con con contributing sentiments that were, that were said at that. But uh, one thing that struck me at that was, um, we did talk about the data, more data. Um, I keep getting asked for that. We need more metrics. And uh, one of the participants um, finally just stood up and said, look, I'm so tired of people asking for more data. We don't, the only justification that should be necessary is that we are 50% of the population. We are half. We ought to be represented. There, we don't need to prove it in any data. I'm so tired of that being a criteria. Men don't have to prove it. So. Yeah, I, we, we will talk about that in a little bit um, as well, kind of uh, around the, this question of the arguments that we're using to, to push the agenda forward. Um, but I recently spoke with a, a colleague um, uh, who works on gender equality in, in workplaces, and she was arguing for um, getting beyond the business case for gender equality, um, because essentially she was like, you know, if, 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 
if organizations don't accept that the world is, or it was the business case for not only gender equality, but for diversity and inclusion. Um, her, her point was that if you don't get that this is, um, um, this is the way that the world is going and this is how you're gonna be more successful, you're ultimately gonna be left behind. So we're not gonna spend our time um, trying to convince you that this is the right thing to do anymore, um, or the smart thing to do um, in addition. Brad. So I, I, can, I can talk a little bit about data and motivation. Uh, when I was, when we were trying to, when we were starting the program to, to increase the number of women in the Australian Army, uh, the Chief of Army at the time was a, was a real advocate of that. And he was providing a lot of very clear and very specific direction about what he wanted to happen and the rate he wanted it to happen at. Uh, and and we, we got an email from him saying, do this. And so I sort of rephrased it to make it slightly politer and transmitted it to our forces command who owned the bulk of the troops in the Army. Uh, and, and straight away they came back and said, where's your analysis? I've, I've got a direction from the Chief of Army to do it. I said, no, but where's, there's no analysis. Like, I've got, got all the analysis I need. <laughs> I've been told that this is going to happen. So, well, we can't go with that. So fill your boots, do as much analysis as you like, but this is what the outcome is going to look like. So when you've done your analysis, can you get to that <laughs> point? And I suggest you do it quickly because he's in a hurry. And, <laughs> and trying to cut through a military system that's designed with the best of intentions to be very thorough and very lockstep and very consequently very slow was a challenge. And, and things that objectively on the surface you might think aren't designed to obstruct can be used to obstruct. You know, our Chief of Air Force had a, had a great quip about uh, change in, in our military that he, he made two or three years ago and he said, when I want to kill an idea, I put it through our normal planning processes. Yeah. Uh, and it'll never happen. <laughs> It's only when you kind of break it out of that and you get personally involved in the outcome that you get what you want from it. Um, I, I've got one other story, and it is it goes to narrative and, and what, what motivates you. And so our, our um, Elizabeth Broderick, who is our sex discrimination commissioner, did a, a really comprehensive report into the treatment of women in the Australian Defence Force, which prompted the cultural reform program uh, that, I, that I worked on for quite some time. And, and when the report was finished, the, the Human Rights Commission and her team retained a relationship with the Australian Defence Force and they would visit units and bases to talk to people about how it was going and what sort of residual issues there were. And then they'd feed that back into the senior leadership as a sort of, you know, allowing them to make policy course corrections. And so it was quite an important program. And, and a great advocate of the program was the Commandant of our Defence Force Academy. And he, so he was responsible, he's a two-star officer responsible for training cadets across all three services. And, and they had a very successful meeting one afternoon that I was at. And at the end of it, they were talking about motivation. And, and, uh, and he said, I tell the cadets, we've got to do this just because it's the right thing to do. And she said, no, 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 it's about operational capability. This makes us more effective. And I thought, isn't this interesting? You've got a senior military officer arguing the human rights perspective. And you've got a human rights commissioner who's responsible for sex discrimination arguing about military operational effectiveness. And there's probably, as, as you've identified, there's probably a false dichotomy in, in, in there, but, but each was so invested in the issue that they'd kind of assimilated the other's position and was now arguing it. And I thought that was quite, quite <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, I think wonderful, but strange. Well, it's, it's interesting, and um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go back to something that Jamie said as well, which is um, if you do get a chance to read The Righteous Mind, um, the book that she referenced, it's one of my all-time favorite books. Um, and uh, I think that strategy of kind of thinking about how do I um, uh, target my message to my audience, how do I, uh, you know, the term that he uses is um, moral foundations. Um, how do I think about kind of what aspects of uh, what do, what kind of moral priorities do my audience, does my audience have and how do I um, kind of activate that in my messaging? So it makes perfect sense from that, uh, from that perspective, but that's a great story and we will get into that kind of um, dichotomy uh, a little bit further on. Um, but without further ado, I do wanna get into the sausage making conversation. Um, so with that said, um, I'd love to hear from each of you kind of how, uh, what implementation looks like day to day um, and feel free to get into as many um, details as you can. I know everybody's kind of in a different place um, and, and at different kind of levels of um, being able to kind of fully implement things. So um, with, with that said, um, who, who wants to begin? Um, 
Yeah, I can. Uh, sure. I'll fill in. Um, yeah, so first, I probably should have said this right out the gate, but a, a little disclaimer for, um, so we are in the U.S. Department of Defense. We're kind of in a, in a weird spot right now where we don't have um, fleshed out U.S. government policy on WPS. Where it's being drafted right now, and then the, the flow down document from that is going to be a strategy, some sort of implementation plan. So we're kind of in a gray zone right now. So what I can do is I can illuminate for you where we are in the process, but I can't speak, I can't give you the official DOD position yet. So what I will do is give you some opinions um, as a professional surface warfare officer who's working in this field. Um, so with that little disclaimer. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what does WPS look like for me on a day-to-day -day basis? So I work inside the Pentagon and um, inside the J-5. It's probably useful to understand a little bit how we bifurcate WPS within DOD. And that is um, in line with the legislation that was passed in 2017 is, a, is a, I'll call it outward facing, right? It's foreign policy based. Um, so a lot of times uh, folks, even within the department, get confused and they think that uh, what, what I do is, is um, U.S. personnel policy, right? Like how do we treat women um, within our own forces? Uh, what is your, what's the transgender policy? You know, no, that is not what I do. That's not um, what we do within the J-5. So J-5 um, uh, is strategy plans and policy, right? So if it was U.S. personnel based, it would be the J-1. Right, so they deal with policy for U.S. personnel within the Joint Force. Um, WPS for DOD is an outward-facing program, efforts. Um, we have counterparts on, on the secretarial side, right, so SecDef and OSD, um, and our shops are both within policy in the humanitarian division, right? Um, so we are, uh, as was already mentioned, in the throes of helping write the strategy uh, that is called for by the legislation. Um, and then as well as gearing up to do the, the, to do our agency implementation plan of that strategy. So the DOD WPS implementation plan, whatever that's going to end up looking like once we get a strategy. So we've held several sessions where we're gearing up to do these things. We contribute to the, to the interagency conversation um, for what the DPS <coughs> strategy is going to look like. Uh, we go to meetings for that. Um, so that's sort of the, the policy making side of things. Um, and then it is also probably useful to, to touch on the gender network that we have. Uh, so we've been doing WPS in DOD officially since 2011, right, when the, when the first NAP was, was put out. Um, and so we have since then uh, put together a DOD gender network, and that looks very similar to what NATO's, NATO has going. So we have gender advisors at specifically the combatant command. Right, so we've got the six geographic combatant commands. Um, we just recently have the, the functionals coming to the table, right? So SOCOM, STRATCOM, CYBERCOM, um, and TRANSCOM. Uh, we also have uh, gender advisors or WPS focal points at, the, at def uh, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency and the regional centers, as well as military academia, right? So at my level at the Pentagon, that those gender advisors and WPS PACs are all at the next level down. We meet with those guys on a monthly basis, right? And they all, if you can imagine, flowing down into their commands have similar structures to some degree or another. Some um, combatant commands have more robust structures than others. Um, but when I say the, gen the DOD gender network, that's kind of what I'm referring to. Um, that's a way for us to reach out um, into a community that kind of understands WPS already. Again, to some extent or another, everybody's at a different place on that trajectory. And I find out what's going on in, let's say, CENTCOM or SOUTHCOM or AFRICOM. Um, in any one of the different geographical areas. Um, and so we meet monthly to synchronize messaging and put out the word and uh, do best practices and, and that type of thing. Is there, I know that everything is still being developed right now, but is there an example of what um, kind of an example of, you know, a, a piece of a strategy might be? Or, you know, what, what's something that's under discussion right now? Um, so do you mean at the, at the USG level? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we've met throughout the year on this, right? And um, at the interagency level, so the NSC convenes us, and we've got uh, state and aid and DOD and DHS, uh, plus some other cats and dogs in the room, um, and trying to organize around goals that support, you know, national security strategy and other sort of national documents that tie into the administration's priorities. Um, there is sort of a recognition uh, that to that we need to stay true to 1325 to some extent, but but also 
understand that it has to support the administration's goals. Like we all have to be aligned up that tree as well. Um, and so, so the you know the four pillars uh, that we talk about so often: participation, prevention, um, protection, and access to relief and recovery are a part of our conversation. So, um, and that that's kind of the approach that we've taken as we are working on the implementation plan. Like. We can't really do that until the strategy's done, but in our conversations and not wanting to get caught too far behind the power curve, we're organizing around those because we realize, we recognize and are hoping that it's not gonna change that much from you know those pieces, those bits and pieces that are 13.5, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Do you have a sense of timeline as well for when the strategy is? Yeah, we do. So we, we stay in pretty good com uh, um, uh, communication with with the NSC on this, who stays in communication with the Hill, right, mm -hmm. who's expecting these things. And the latest that we have is uh, by the end of the calendar year, we expect the WTF strategy. Um, and then um, we also expect 90 days from that that the agencies will um, owe an implementation plan for their agencies for the strategy. Okay. What do you see? Sure, so I can talk a little bit about the um, the civil society ecosystem that kind of builds up around these policy processes and how we try to influence and support and, and everything in between. So um, I think civil society's support for the US National Action Plan before and now implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security Act and the new strategy and the implementation plans and all these jargony words that are coming out of that. <laughs> um, our, our capacities and, and what we focus on tend to um, cluster around, I think, four types of main contributions. So one is obviously research, um, because we need this evidence to go into these policy meetings and make the case and you know have people take this seriously as a security issue. Um, one is ex ground level experience, right? Um, so ideally, with, when WPS works well, you have these policies that are being crafted by policymakers or by state institutions with women from civil society groups who are experiencing the reality of these security and peace challenges on the ground every day, right? Because they're going to bring the ground truth of what women's experiences are into the policy discussion. So it's not just that we're trying to get to a place where women are feeding into government structures, it's that in the process of getting there, we need to include women. So we're not only getting there, but we're also practicing what we preach, right? Um, so it's also bringing you know, large INGOs who have country level programming in the many countries around the world where the US is present to have them bring their experiences to the discussion. Um, and so that involves, you know, consultations with civil society groups on what should be in the strategy. Um, there's technical advice. So um, that's kind of the hat that I put on now, which is taking lessons from um, inclusive securities work with national action plans all around the world and saying, you know, what are the um, what are the key ingredients for every national action plan that makes it work? What are the lessons that we've learned from doing this in Bosnia, in the UK, in Canada, in Finland, in Afghanistan, wherever it is? How do we bring those lessons back here? Um, you know, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to funnel this kind of objective, more technical level advice to help you do your job. Um, and then the last one is uh, advocacy, of course. And so, um, you know, I can share a great anecdote about how, for example, um, the, maybe this is getting a little bit too into the weeds of things, but um, DOD has never actually gotten funding for WPS in the past, right? Um, and recently with the, um, in the last NDAA and the appropriation cycle that came afterwards, um, some civil society groups came together to try to work with Congress to get DOD money for, this, for implementing this for the first time. And it's a great example of how this works. So um, I had attended a PACOM, well, out of Indo-PACOM, they were hosting the first DOD operational gender advisor course. So they basically developed this course one week long. This is what gender advisors will get to know how to do their job. Um, and they were piloting this out at Indo-PACOM. They invited me to, to attend and observe and to speak. And afterwards, I wrote an article. So this gets into the, the role of media. And it said, you know, isn't this great? There's this wonderful new course that's happening. It's so needed. But you know, we really need money to take this to other combatant commands to train up the gender structures that we need to do this well. Um, folks on the Hill, some staffers, read that article, came over to DOD and said, it's interesting. We hear that you're doing this. What kind of money do you need? What would you, what would you do with the money if you had it? They put together their list of what they wanted to do with it. And then other organizations like CFR and other allies in civil society helped shepherd that process by working with congressional allies in the Hill. Lo and behold, 
DOD got four million for implementation. So it kind of gives you a sense of all the different actors in the ecosystem and how you have the technical folks, you have the advocacy folks who are working with the champions on the hill, who are working with each other, you have the you know, gender folks within the government institutions who are serving as the internal advocates and can you know, articulate the need from their institutions. And ideally, this ecosystem kind of works together to build off one another's strengths. So that's, I think, probably the best picture I can paint of how civil society is organizing around this process right now. Yeah, that's a really, really useful story. Uh, so I think the, the, the key thing to having WPS made an effective operational tool or an operational effect, a gender perspective included in what we do, is, is that it needs to be institutionalised and it needs to be institutionalised as quickly as, as it possibly can be. And so that strategic level stuff that, that you were referring to needs to exist because that provides the umbrella coverage for the program. But, but you need to think about well, what is it that causes military people to behave in a, the way they do? What, 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 you know, what defines what you do? What guides you when you're on an operation? And so it's, it's your, your doctrine, which is your operational policy, and it's your training. And so you need to get women, women peace and security into doctrine as quickly as you can. And you need to get it into the professional military education and training system as quickly as you can. Uh, so that people are trained to behave in the way that you want them to. And, and people have got the reference documents to allow them to, to, to know what to do when they, when they do that. Uh, that is really important, but that's where it gets really difficult because that's where you start getting into the contact sport of resource allocation inside a, a, a Department of Defence. And as good as your agenda might be in a moral or ethical sense, that seems to matter less when you start talking about, I need 10 positions for instructors and gender advisors, or I need money to, to pay for the development of training, uh, or I need training courses to be two or three days longer so that we can incorporate this, this program into them. Uh, and all those resources are finite. And so if, if I get 10 people, that means someone else has 10 less people. And, and they will fight. That's, that's how it works. And so getting into that space is difficult and time consuming, but it's where you have to be. Um, to give you an example, we developed the Gender Advisor course. Uh, it was developed in our Joint Operations Command, which is like our one combatant command that looks after operations around the whole world. It was a, it was a really good program. It was really thought through. Its, its natural and eventual home was in the Australian uh, Defence College. It took over a year to get them to accept that package, uh, to, to develop it in a way that they were prepared to, to adopt it and to find the resources in perpetuity that would satisfy them that this wasn't going to take money or people away from other work that they were already doing. And that was a year with the support of the Chief of the Defence Force. And so that was, you know, and a lot of my blood on the floor of various officers along the way. That was quite a painful process, but the end result was necessary. It's the same with writing the doctrine. The, the professional military and education program that we developed, the individual training framework, uh, took over 18 months to put together. And that was to give it to the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Defence College for them to then spend a period of analysing their training and figuring out how to incorporate it into their training. So that still hasn't happened, but it will. The, the reason why those processes are so important, at least in an Australian context, is because once it's there, it's there forever. Once it's in doctrine, it'll be there next time doctrine's rewritten. It'll never come out. Once it's in the individual training, it requires the same level of effort to pull it out. Uh, if you keep on running it as an add-on, or as a tack-on, or as a special program, um, or as an elective, then it's easy to, to cancel when things get difficult. So institutionalisation is critical. The other piece that's critical from an operational effect perspective is getting the intelligence agencies to start thinking about gender and disaggregated data and the so what that comes from that when they're looking at where you're going to be doing, you know, where you're going to operate. Because the planners need that information to plan. And, and we started with the planners and with the best will that they had and with some very experienced gender advisors helping them 
they were coming back and saying, look, we've got nothing to work with. This doesn't mean anything to us. Our data isn't, you know, the data we're getting on the operation, on, on the area and what we need to do doesn't include gender. So we don't know how to plan this. And so you need to go back up into the sort of, the, you know, the three-letter acronym intelligence agencies and get them to start doing that work. And then that flows through the system. And when, from the top, gender is flowing down through the planning process, you know, NATO talks about the, the, the golden thread running through the planning process. And when you've got doctrine that supports its consideration, when you've got people trained in that, then it will be institutionalised. You'll have the effect that you want. So you're kind of getting to another question that I had, which is what will success ultimately look like? Um, and it may be that success is going to be a kind of dynamic and ever-changing thing. Um, but I'm curious, you know, Brad, you're talking about the institutionalization of, of WPS and gender as being um, kind of an ultimate metric of, of success. Um, I'm curious, um, Commander Maynard and Olivia, if there are other um, elements that we should be um, uh, moving towards when it comes to what, what success will look like. Well, I think it includes what Brad got to, but a very simple metric of, of success, simple but very challenging, would be just if WPS, if, if I go to work in, in my Department of Defense and women, peace and security and gender considerations are normalized in my workplace as far as like uh, something professional that we talk about uh, because it's part of our doctrine, because it's something that we do, because we are interested in providing, you know, both internally the most, um, you know, the, the, best, the best fighting force that we can for our citizens and for the world, and externally uh, providing the best picture for our commanders, providing, um, you know, our, our gender considerations in our operations. If, if all of those considerations were normalized within the Department of Defense, I would consider that a metric of success. Um, um, so on the kind of policy dry side, it would look like DOD having an incredibly hashed out implementation plan that reflects not only what right looks like, but what is realistic to accomplish. Um, that is well-funded and that is accompanied by a streamlined, so it's, it's possible to do it, but also um, effective m and &E plan, monitoring evaluation plan that we can use, sorry, that they can use over the next four years to continuously track what's happening, what's working, what's not, and adjust. Um, so that's kind of on the institutional side, but in a more meta sense, <laughs> like with security sectors around the world, it would look like security sectors that reflect and are in better service to the populations that they're meant to serve. What are some of the biggest challenges that each of you face? Um, and, and kind of as a corollary to that, where are you getting significant pushback um, in trying to push forward this agenda? I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to. Um, okay, you're gonna have to bear with me because this is something that's been kind of rattling around in my mind, and I'm still trying to figure out how to how to put this into words. But it means that it's hot off the press, so <laughs> right, that's good for you. Get your um, live actually, tweeting ready, everybody. Right, yeah. I'm actually thinking about your questions. Um, so one of the the most powerful effects that we see of national action plans, which again are it's just a fancy word for national strategy for implementing women, peace, and security. One of the most powerful benefits we see of even the most ineffective plan is that it creates space for civil society and government institutions, particularly security actors, to continuously and meaningfully engage over a period of time, right? And these are two kind of sectors of the population that don't rarely come together. And if they do, they're not coming together usually on national security. They might be coming together on foreign policy, on development, but national security is one in which we, we don't really see this kind of more expansive community that includes both, you know, activists and your uniform military. So the, the process of even putting together a national action plan, because it's such a long process, I mean, it can take a year, it could take more. In some ways, the process is more important than the policy itself. Um, because you have this, this space for these groups to come together to learn what one, what one another actually do, to understand each other's value, and to lower the mutual suspicion that often exists, right? So there's, I'm sure you're all familiar with the suspicion, or I shouldn't even say suspicion, the you know, <laughs> sentiment within the WPS community that you know, should we be working with militaries or is that militarizing this space, right? The, the end result that we're working towards here is getting rid of war. So why are we working with those who are perpetrating war? And that's a very legitimate you know, and prevalent point of view. 
And then on the other side, you have militaries who are like, okay, hold on, you wanna talk to me about feminism? You wanna talk to me about gender equality? I might empathize with that you know, within my own life and my personal family, but that's not my mission. So, so bringing those two together in a place where they're actually collaborating on policy, I think is very powerful. That being said, um, there's this great quote from Robert Engel who says that the extreme nature of the military's task means that military organizations have a right and indeed a need to be different from broader society. And so they develop this professional culture and this lingo, you know, massive amounts of acronyms and processes that make them more effective in doing that, but in the process also makes them appear even more foreign, even more um, difficult to understand to your layman or lame woman. So talking about participation is great, but actually bringing these folks together and trying to speak in a way that the other, you're trying to talk to the other in a way that they hear you, but that doesn't dilute the transformative power of bringing to get together two very different worlds. And that's, I think, the greatest challenge that we experience, not only with national action plans abroad, it's also within the US, is finding those groups who are not intimidated by one another on both sides, are willing to engage, but are also willing to, you know, budget for one person in their organization to take the time to learn the lingo and learn the processes and learn the internal machinery to be able to work together in a more lasting way. And ultimately valuing that other side, right, enough to make that investment, which is a huge hurdle to get over. Right. Can I just make one point? Because I think what you said is incredibly relevant. And one of the things I've sort of reflected on over the years is in a military perspective, you don't actually know, need to know a lot about women, peace and security to be an effective gender advisor and probably an effective change agent. But you need to know a lot about military systems and military processes mm -hmm. so that you can use that small amount of knowledge effectively. Um, there, are, there are a lot of people, and I'm not, I hope I'm not coming across as being critical, that know an awful lot about women, peace and security and about gender that aren't very effective in a military environment because they don't know who to talk to and what to say and when to say it. And so that, that, that balance is, is very important. I also, you know, as, as a man that came into this conversation, this world, you know, sort of late, um, it's actually quite an intimidating place to be yeah. at this start. And you face the same issue, that you don't know what words to use or what language is appropriate or who am I going to offend? And, and I don't want to offend anyone, but I think I've got a point to make, but I don't know what words are appropriate in this environment. It's a minefield. And, and so, you know, that, that meeting halfway and I think both sides need to be accommodating and understanding of the other. I have a question along those lines, because I was going to allude to that when, on my turn, um, but have you found it to be as intimidating as you thought it would be, or, or is it a pretty forgiving community when you reflect um, on it? <laughs> I, I, I assume it must be a very forgiving community. Lots, <laughs> lots of people have had more than one conversation with me. Uh, it's... But it, it, it's... I think it's it's a difficult area for you know, um, the the very traditional advocates of women, peace, and security. The the women who believe there's too much violence in the world, and this should be a mechanism for reducing the amount of conflict, the amount of violence. Uh, we all believe that, but but and and see the military as part of the problem, mm -hmm. not as potentially part of the solution. Uh, it's, a, it's difficult to have that conversation. And, and, and you know, to, to, two very brief examples. When the Japanese wrote their national action plan, the civil society organisations did not want the Japanese Ministry of Defence mm -hmm. involved in the conversation because they were the problem. Militarism, militarism was the problem. And so that, I think that was short-sighted and wrong. Um, yeah, the two, of the, two of the civil society representatives uh, in the Australian Interdepartmental Working Group, so the mechanism for managing the implementation of our national action plan across government, uh, are, are from WILP and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And, and it's interesting talking to them. <laughs> and, and I got on very well, and we made a point of, of building relationships that were as strong as we could possibly make them over a lot of coffee. And, <laughs> and I, I reflected once and said, oh, look, I think it's, it's amazing that, you know, I can sit here with the, you know, the, the national president of WILP and have a conversation about women in the military and about women, peace and security in a military environment. She said, oh no, I'm not, I'm not here as the president of WILP. You know, there'd be some real issues with a lot of our members if, if they thought that I was representing them in this. Yeah. 
So that, that I think, is, is, is an indication of where, you know, you need to come together and you need to be able to be prepared to have a conversation and accept that you have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And accept also that the military application of women, peace and security is always going to be a, a subset of the total agenda, the total problem, and we can only solve part of the problem. Uh, and, and not expect too much of militaries, but also not give militaries a free pass for the things they should be doing that aren't. Mm -hmm. I, I too have heard the argument when uh, militaries may not have a, a piece of this because we're moving toward peace and we're not trying to milita militarize the world. But, um, you know, I think that's wrong for a couple of reasons. Um, and and one, one is the participation aspect, right? Like we're trying to represent the society that we are protecting. Um, you know, so from the participation and representation standpoint, like if WPS really is pervasive throughout communities and cultures and societies, the military is a part of that. Um, and so, so there you go. Um, and then the other piece of it is like we absolutely have a role in deterrence, right? And uh, like Brad alluded to, um, in the in the we are, we're an arm of diplomacy, so uh, working with state and with aid, DoD often supports um, in development roles. Um, we, we work with foreign militaries and foreign, this foreign security sectors, their polices and, uh, police forces, and, and in, this, in those same rights, we want um, you know, those sectors to be representative of the population that they're protecting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so for all of those reasons, uh, I definitely think that DOD has a slice of, of WPS, um, but like Brad said, a piece of it, right? There's this much larger picture out there. Um, in terms of biggest challenges, um, we, we already kind of touched on this a little bit too, but uh, culturally, Right, uh, particularly in the U.S. with the Me, the Me Too movement, right, um, and some other things going on societally and politically. Um, there, I, what I have run into uh, in working in this field in, in DoD is is a very uh, real hesitation um, for members to get involved because they don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't. It, it's a scary, uh, um, nebulous, a dynamic, and, and so they're much. They're much more comfortable in their black and white, you know, military checklist, everything that's in doctrine already. Um, and so, um, so dealing with that cultural hesitation uh, has been challenging because, as we've as we've already talked about, culture is a very, it's a very, uh, it's a tough thing to change, and uh, it's it's pervasive. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest challenges. Um, well, I want to dig in a little bit more to this kind of idea of how do we bring different groups together and how do we kind of um, uh, create messages that, that unite people or that, that um, enhance our understanding of these issues. Um, and Brad, earlier you alluded to this kind of um, uh, these dueling um, arguments that we've had in the field to kind of socialize the agenda, one being around operational effectiveness, um, the other being around this is kind of the moral or ethical um, uh, thing to do. This is, you know, kind of, we have this kind of effectiveness versus justice um, dichotomy. Um, and something that I have been thinking a lot recently is kind of, if, if this is a false dichotomy that we've set up, does it have to be either or? And, and also, um, what happens when we rely too much on the effectiveness piece? Um, because what if uh, there's a situation where um, women and gender are integrated um, and maybe it's not as effective or that, that, that doesn't end up, you know, we, we, um, uh, the effectiveness argument is contingent on that always happening every time. And so what if it doesn't? Does that mean that, um, you know, the, the moral and just, just, justice argument isn't there? Um, so I'm curious um, for, for each of you how you see uh, this process of kind of making the argument um, and bringing people together. Um, you know, how do we, how should we think about kind of crafting um, these arguments and these messages um, to, to both kind of enhance understanding um, and, and kind of persuade people that this is important um, while um, uh, making room for the expansiveness of this issue? So really easy question. To <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you want to start? Can I? Because I, I, I can I really confuse everyone? Because I've, I've I've been thinking about this a lot, and I don't have any clarity in my mind. Uh, the, so <laughs> no, so the, the, the first thing I'll say is uh, the, the the narrative is incredibly important. Uh, and and a few years ago on our Anzac Day, which is uh, sort of the, one of the most significant national events in Australia, and it commemorates military service originally from World War One, but but more recent conflicts as well. The, the Chief of Army stood up 
and made a statement that what he would like to see is that the, the story of Anzac Day be broadened from talking about sort of, you know, white male soldiers to talking about indi the role that Indigenous Australians and, and female service people have played in our conflicts. And, and the reaction was swift and violent. And it, it came from politicians, it came from the media, it came from veterans groups, it came from individual veterans. It, it didn't so much come from inside the workforce, but I think that sentiment was there. That this is just sort of feminazi social engineering and, and it's, it's ridiculous. And, and, and putting that aside, the, the issue to me was, well, how do you change the narrative inside an organisation when you don't own the narrative? When the leadership of the organisation doesn't own the narrative, but it's the broader society think they do. And so you have to convince them before you're allowed to change the narrative, and that's, that's even harder. But it's incredibly important. And, and, and what will resonates with people will be different based on you know, their experiences and their position in the organisation and the expectations the organisation has of them and they have of the organisation. And, and that's where I think that dichotomy becomes important because I can talk to you know, a Chief of the Defence Force uh, and, 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 and the current Australian Chief of the Defence Force has said he thinks more women and women, peace and security is important because if, if we don't do those things, we're missing out on half of, the, half of the good people and half of the information. That's not an argument that resonates with a, a, you know, a squad leader um, or, a, you know, or a, 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 someone that works in a, on a, a nuclear-powered submarine and, and you know, runs the electrical generation system. So having arguments that resonate with all of those people, I think, is important. This is where it gets confusing in my mind. I also think it's a trap to believe that we can only do this or we should only do this or this will only be successful if we can convince everyone that it's a good idea and they should all be individually motivated to do it. You know, I don't like the tank that we bought. Uh, I don't like the decision that we just made about what type of frigate to buy in Australia. You know, there are lots of things about the military I don't like, but no one asks my opinion <laughs> and, and it doesn't seem like those decisions are contingent on whether I think they're good or, mm. or, or, or right or not. So, so why do we fall in the trap of assuming that the workforce has to love this before it can be effective? You know, and this is, comes back to my point about institutionalisation. I don't care if you like it or not. If it's in your doctrine and if it's in your training, you have to do it, so go away and do it. But I prefer if you liked it. And if you do like it, well, we have to find the right, you know, we, we have to find the right argument to try and convince as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would add to that. I mean, I think it's, ideally, you always have the groundswell that's asking for it, right? That's driving the demand. The top-down mandate, and thankfully in militaries, you actually can order people to do stuff. But then, there, you know, there's also this behavioral incentive that you're going to have more effective implementation if people genuinely believe in it. And that's where I think we have a lot to learn from behavioral science and what organizational change looks like, whether it's in an organization that is DOD or whether it's an organization that is, you know, in the private sector, what incentivizes people to make this change. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit from, again, the civil society um, perspective as I see it. So I think there are two pieces of it. One of it is, one is the advocacy angle, right? And Jamie gave a great presentation of like strategic communications 101, right? You need to know your audience. You need to tailor your message effectively. You need to talk the way that they hear. Um, you need to figure out, you know, what their core interests are and tailor what you're offering to their core interests so you're helping them do their job better, um, give them a vision of what success looks like that aligns with their own, so on and so forth. And, you know, where this gets tricky with security sectors is that whether or not we like it, um, military's core mission for the most part is to fight and win wars. So I think it's, it's not to advance gender equality, right? So someone might empathize with that, but unless I can tie this directly to their mission and their mandate and how this is going to help them achieve that, the rest is kind of discretionary, right? It's kind of up to them whether or not they want to do it. So I think from an advocacy perspective, you do have to tailor the messaging to what their core mission is, otherwise they don't have a mandate to do it. Um, and I think state and aid would rightfully say you shouldn't be advancing gender equality. That's kind of, that's our, our game. Um, from a more meta philosophical level, I'm sorry, you caught me at a very meta day. I <laughs> um, I Great. Think, <laughs> I think the the transformational power of women, peace, and security is the idea that security and justice cannot be decoupled. It's that 
you know, I think it's I think it's really interesting and and particularly curious that the international community has by and large examined and accepted the premise that participatory democracy is the most peaceful, stable form of governance in the long run, right? In the short term, it's going to be more um, volatile. It's going to cause more instability because you have more cooks in the kitchen. But ultimately, it is the most stable form of governance. Um, the international community has largely examined and accepted, accepted the premise that participatory development is the way to go, right? That the forms of development that are designed by those who they're meant to help um, and are owned by those who are meant to help will be more sustainable and more effective in the long run. But when it comes to security, there is no talk about participatory security. And I don't know why that has been so overlooked. And to me, WPS does not come from a place of, you know, this is the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do. Yes, it does, but it came out of a very real need from women in Bosnia and Rwanda who were emerging from these horrible wars and saying, this didn't work, something here failed. And yes, it's the right thing to do, but ultimately you are coming up with the wrong security solutions for the problems that we're experiencing. So it's the idea that security will be more effective in the long term if it is just, if it is participatory, and if it is crafted by those who it's meant to help, because otherwise we're all just you know, up here kind of guessing at what, what people really need. So, you know, whether we call it women, peace, and security, participatory security, inclusive security, it's the same premise that, you know, justice and effectiveness go hand in hand. And, you know, you can use them differently in your advocacy, but ultimately that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's incredibly well said. I hope everybody was taking notes. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and Commander Rayner. Yeah, just, just a couple things. So um, I don't think, I mean, do you, so again, DOD slice of WPS, right? Um, I don't think uh, that DOD will ever be able to get away from the operational effectiveness. I, I mean, I can't yeah. motivate my troops and, and it doesn't flow down from national security strategy and so forth into DOD that this is the right thing to do and that's why we should be doing it. For us, it is always about operational effectiveness and mission accomplishment. That's how we get our resources. That's how we get our funding. Um, it's through those do that through those document flows. So I, I just think operational effectiveness, um, and, and it works, right? Like for everything that Olivia just said, um, participation, uh, you know, putting a gender perspective to our operations, the intelligence piece, right? Um, it, it's very relevant, um, and it is all about effectiveness. Um, so on the uh, on the um, the getting the public on board, which is Suzanne Maynard's opinion. <laughs> um, I am, all, and from, from my experience, um, uh, you know, being the CEO of a warship, I'm all for getting public buy-in, uh, and and it's much better if you do that. But if, but, but people in leadership positions are are put there and are cast there uh, for a reason. The mantle is heavy. If you have a vi a better vision for how things can be, lead. Mm -hmm. That is why you are there to make those tough decisions. Um, you know, and and if you do a good job, people will follow. Well, I'll just ask, I have so many more questions here, but I'll just ask one more and then we'll open it up to audience questions because I'm sure everybody has many of those. Um, and this is for all of the researchers in the room. Um, if you had unlimited funding to explore or research one question related to WPS, what would it be? I, I'll answer that one first yeah. because my, my answer is kind of, I mean, for, for me, from my perspective, from where I sit right now, I. I would love some answers on the assessment, monitoring, and evaluation <laughs> piece. <laughs> because, and I know there's, there's research that's out there, and I know there's proxy indicators, and everybody's sort of, there's a lot of folks and groups that have tackled that from, from various angles, both in academia and, and civil society and a little bit the military. Um, but it's very confusing for me and my leadership. They are asking me for, you know, the, the business case. Um, and, and, and we do want to track our progress. When we, when we uh, finally do come up with an implementation plan and we move forward for the next four years, we're going to want to monitor how we're doing, how we're spending the money, we're going to need some metrics. So, um, so if we could get some, some like cohesive, holistic like advice on that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, I'll go out on a limb. I'd, I'd love to see work on masculinity and violence. Uh, yeah, I think if, if, you, if you get right to the very, I'll be, I'll be macro too, if you get right to the very macro level, yeah, everyone agrees, <laughs> I hope, that we want to reduce the amount of violence in the world, whether that's conflict or whether that's you know, violence in, in um, 
you know, criminal violence in societies. And we also know that the, the, that the vast majority of all violence is, is perpetrated by men, whether it's sanctioned by the state or whether it's not. So there's a massive so what in that to me. Mm -hmm. It's, well, then, how do, you, how do you reduce the amount of violence in society, which is the goal of the WPS agenda, without talking about men and without understanding what motivates men to be violent and what motivates you know, male-dominated organisations to be violent? I mean, how do we... What can we do about that? And, and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'd love to see that as research. I, that, that it's an incredibly complicated, difficult conversation to have with a military audience, and I don't want to be the first person to have to do that. But, but it would be, I think, incredibly valuable to understand more about that. If I had all the money in the world. Yes. And a magic something. wand. And a magic as well. wand. Yes. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, I would fund a research study that looks globally. Um, into every country and asks a representative sample of women's organizations in that country what they would spend their national defense budget on. Mm -hmm. And then because I have this magic wand, I would <laughs> wave that, and then I would be able to actually study the, um, what peace and security outcomes look like when the, those uh, funding models are flipped on their heads. Great. Okay, so for all the funders out there and researchers, <laughs> the next and project. sorcerers, right? <laughs> yeah, and sorcerers, exactly. <laughs> you never know who's in the audience. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, um, who who has some questions for our panelists? Yes. First, thank you. That was fantastic, um, Suzanne. Um, uh, everything I've heard has been spectacularly true, um, but I'm a practical <laughs> guy, and you're a practical lady. Sure. Uh, you had to be to be successful in what you've done up to this point. Uh, most folks in the military are that way. It is about the job. It's about making sure the job gets done right and making sure that they understand all the factors involved in that. One of the most um, serious problems I think we have is not really doctrine and training, Brad. I, I, although I agree with what you said, to change institutions, you have to get it into the institution. But that's not the fastest way to start the change. The fastest way is to start at the top and convince the people leading the organization that things need to change. I was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for four years, and I had never heard the term woman, peace, and security until I came to the Bush School. <laughs> yeah. Now there was an office in the joint. There was an office in the joint staff at that time. You said it started in 2011. Um, the joint chiefs of staff, for those who don't know this, meet two times a week, and we discuss either ongoing or potential responses, military, instrument of national power responses to either crisis, conflict, or support for humanitarian relief that the State Department or USID are leading. As Suzanne said, there has never been a member of the joint chiefs who's a woman. Never. We've only had one of the U.S. combatant commanders, who are the people who actually lead these activities, who was a woman. That was General Lori Robinson, who just retired, so now we're back to not having a woman. So around the table, there is never a woman, and hasn't been in the past. So, and I doubt if you're read into all the discussions that we're having into the tank. And so if you could make a recommendation to the chairman, and it would be completely anonymous. <laughs> I'll just mention that he was my next door neighbor for almost five years. Um, so you'll slip a note under his door, the, is what you're um, saying? What would you recommend to the <laughs> chairman to make sure that before people came to the table to have those discussions, they were sensitized to the type of issues that WPS raises um, that they should be considering in their planned responses? Is it advisors for each of the service chiefs that the department hires? Is it um, having someone in the room as an advisor during those conversations who's read into the right level, even if it's not a member of the, uh, of the Joint Chiefs or a combatant commander? How do we make sure there is a voice at the table who's always thinking uh, through a, uh, from a different perspective? So that's a great question, sir, and hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying this. Um, but I, I do think the doctrine piece is important because that's a long-term solution and flows, flows down through the organization. Um, but you're right, that's not a quick fix. Um, and so um, I would have to say, uh, and, and then also getting women at the table at those higher levels is a much, it takes a very long time to grow a chairman. 
It takes a very long time to grow a chief of, you know, chief of the Air Force and so forth. Um, and, and there's lots of reasons why women leave, right, before they even get there uh, for personal choice or, or promotion or whatever. Um, so in the interim, for the quick, for the quick fix, and maybe even for long-term institutionalization, um, I, I do think uh, gender advisors uh, would be a good way to begin to crack into that and to, make, to, and to begin to start demystifying and normalizing the conversation mm -hmm. about gender. Um, and there's a number of ways you could do that, right? Um, uh, you could do an executive coaching program, which is one-on-one, -on -one, right? So let's begin to have a conversation behind a closed door with somebody who has the knowledge of the WPS language and can have a conversation with that executive for um, how does this apply to my realm, the things that my sphere of influence, um, in, in sort of in, in a place where it's just the two of them and they can have some open and honest um, dialogue uh, that you, not, you wouldn't necessarily want to say like publicly to your troops, right? Um, and that's re really where you can get to the heart of some things. Um, so I think that that would be having gender advisors at, you know, for the leadership, um, either in the room at, at the meetings, advising, you know, from the back seat, or uh, having conversations before leadership goes into the to the tanks in the meetings. I think that would be a good a good start, a very good start. Well, it is uh, very sad that we are, I think, out of time at this moment. But the, the good thing is we have a break, I think, right now in the schedule. So hopefully you can um, ask your questions of, of, of the fantastic panelists here um, at that time. But please give them a round of applause. Thank you.